If you were in the early service, you already know Dr. J. Scalar. Those of you who are not and haven't read your bulletin yet, uh, Dr. Scalar teaches at Covenant Theological Seminary. He is also vice president and dean of academics at Covenant. He is a friend of this church. He is certainly um, one that uh, many of us have seen in different contexts throughout the country, but also particularly at Covenant Theological Seminary. I just say this about introducing uh, Jay this morning. Uh, Dr. Vasholtz, who is here this morning with his wife, Julia, was asked uh, recently, what do you believe you were able to accomplish in your time at Covenant Seminary over 40 years that he was there? And he said, well, I know one thing that I did and that was to bring Jay Scalar to Covenant Theological Seminary. Now, any of you who know Dr. Vasholtz knows that is far from the truth. He, he has done amazing things, and the students that he has taught and who are now teaching spread all around the world. So, Dr. V, we're very thankful for you and your contribution to the kingdom work. But he did do this one good thing. He brought Dr. J. Scalar to Covenant, and now we are bringing him here to talk about Leviticus with you. Dr. Scalar, would you come, please? All right. Well, good morning. Um, Yes, Bob did many good things up at the seminary, and I would be remiss if I did... Where, where are you sitting here, Bob? Are you here? The, there you are. Okay. Good. When, when I first uh, came to uh, St. Louis to interview, Bob and Julia took me out for supper. Uh, we went to the Olive Garden, if I remember correctly, and uh, by the end of the meal, I began to wonder... How many uncles does Bob actually have? I mean, story after story, but it's just wonderful. And, uh, but to be able to work for six or seven years together with a, a man so godly and who devoted his life, it, that, that was just such a real um, treasure and privilege for me. So it's been great to see you again, brother. Um, so this morning we're going to be talking about Leviticus. And uh, I've actually been asked... To, to give away, well, for, first a few things. Um, the commentary, uh, this hasn't been told to you yet, but just in terms of its effectiveness, I've learned that it has healed at least eight people of insomnia. So they just, you know, get in and non-habit forming. So, you know, if that's just, just one more reason to sign up. Uh, I've also been given two of these shirts to give away. And so um, I was hoping, you know, John and Mike could be up here with the slingshot and <laughs> propel it out to you, but uh, I'll just throw. Um, so uh, first question, this, this t-shirt is for, uh, who knows, without looking, how many, how many chapters are in the book of Leviticus? 27. Oh, you have to put up your hand. Who, who said 27? Was that you, Josh? All right. There we go. Very good. Okay, now second question. I think this is one of the last t-shirts. So if no one gets this, then I'm just going to keep this one. Um, but this should be easy enough. Could somebody from memory quote Leviticus chapter 3, verse 3? Uh, no one? Okay, great. <laughs> Can anyone quote any verse from the book of Leviticus? Seriously, yes. Exodus. You're, 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 you're close. You're so close. Uh huh. Yeah. A a anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Great diet plan in Leviticus. Yeah. Do not eat anything that. Exodus-ish again. That, Leviticus kind of has something like that. I saw a hand over here. Leviticus 23-19. Um, Lord is not a man that he should lie, nor is not a man that he should take the line. Numbers 23-19. <laughs> I think this is making clear. Everyone here needs this study. I mean, 
just bring the site, just pass the sheets around. I mean, anyone, a verse from Leviticus? How about, um, what does, what is Leviticus 16 about? <laughs> they, Day of Atonement, there we go, all right. Well, what I'd like, what I'd like to do today is, is just give you a bit of an overview of Leviticus, um, pick up on some key themes, uh, uh, want to begin um, by just discussing together why we, we often struggle with Leviticus. Um, I also have here, it's not too often you find cartoons that address the book of Leviticus, uh, but here's one I did find, coming down from the mountain, that says Leviticus. <laughs> you actually get that quicker than my classes do, so yeah, that's well done. Uh, many of us, though, we, we often struggle with the book of Leviticus. And I'd like to just spend the first few minutes talking about different reasons why. And maybe helping us to put some of those reasons in perspective. So let, let me ask you all, what are some of the reasons that we struggle, many of us struggle at least, with the book of Leviticus? Let me see some, some hands. What, what kind of reasons? Yes? It talks about weird stuff, at least weird stuff to us, right? Ritual purity and impurity, for example. Well, what in the world is that? We don't, we don't really have that as a category. All right, so there's the, there's the weird factor, right? What else? Great, what else? Don't understand what these other things mean, like festivals and all these other things are kind of there. Yes, yeah, so it... it it talks about a lot of different um, uh, rituals and events that we don't practice anymore, and so they can seem uh, strange to us, and, and sometimes, do you ever read through Leviticus thinking, wow, all this stuff is really burdensome, like how would I figure out how to do all this, how would I remember all of this, right? So there's the weirdness factor, the, the strangeness burden factor, what else? Other reasons, yes? Yeah, you, you read through and there are, there are very harsh penalties that are found in the book of Leviticus. You, you read, for example, about um, Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10, one of the few stories in the book. These are two priests, the sons of Aaron, who um, come to the, the tabernacle and fire comes out and consumes them, right? So they're the harsh penalties. So what, what, do, what do we have so far? The weirdness factor, the the strangeness burden factor, the harsh penalties, yeah? The conflict we see with modern culture and some of the things they say in Yeah, so as, as modern people reading this book, some of the things, it's, even if we believe the Bible, we're still influenced by modern culture, aren't we? You know, as you live in the world, modern culture is like a mist. And it's so fine, you often don't see it, but, but it's, it's getting on you. And it's impacting you, and so you read through, and wow, the sexual ethics, for example, in the book of Leviticus, are completely countercultural today. Right? Okay, what, why else? Other reasons why we struggle with Leviticus? Yes. Like you said this morning, we know that Christ became our ultimate sacrifice and appreciated for our sins, so we don't want to get bogged down in all these laws and all these things. Uh -huh. We don't really see the relevance. Yeah, so, so we, we struggle with the relevance, right? So... Let me sort of tie this into it's full of laws, right? Very few stories. In fact, you go through the book, there's a story in chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu get killed. Uh, there's a story of, you know, the, the uh, initiation of the tent of meeting in chapters 8 through 10 in the priesthood. And then there's a story in chapter 24 of a blasphemer who also gets killed. Uh, and then chapter 26 has blessings and curses and everything else is law, right? And very few of us think, well, let me just go home tonight and cuddle up with a book of, you know, 27 chapters of law and a few stories of people getting killed and blessings and curses. I mean, that's, that's just not high on our list, right? So laws seem strange. I mean, the different, different things we could mention, but let me, uh, let me add one. 
um, ritual in general, we can be suspicious about as modern people. Um, and especially as evangelical Protestants, you know, we, we sometimes, I grew up um, looking at ritual and ceremony as belonging to dead religion, um, as impersonal, and as something that wasn't really alive and living and active. So these are all different reasons why we struggle with the book of Leviticus. And let, let, let me begin to go through and, and just talk about some of those reasons, um, help us think through them a bit, and then turn to an overview of the book itself. Uh, so what were our different things? There was, oh, the weirdness factor, right? Things like ritual purity and impurity. Do you know why some of the things in Leviticus are so weird to us? Now, this is going to sound strange the first time I say it. It's because God is a master communicator. And here's what I mean by that. Because God is a master communicator, he speaks to people in language that they can understand. If you look at a master teacher, a master teacher will take students from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Right? And so what you have in Leviticus is God is speaking. Is he speaking to 21st century people? Who is he speaking to? Israelites who are living in the 15th century BC who are very different people and as God is speaking to them what he does is he often theologians call this accommodation that is to say God uses language and cultural artifacts that those people are familiar with in order to explain his laws. And so the reason it sounds often so weird to us is because some of their cultural realities are so different than our own. Does that make, does that make sense at all? So, so for example, um, let me start with an easier example, a New Testament example. Um, Paul says in Thessalonians, greet one another with a holy kiss. You know? Now, not once has an American man ever greeted me with a holy kiss. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Right? <laughs> but once a year, I get to go to France to teach. And I am regularly greeted on both sides of the cheek with, with a holy kiss. See, that's part of French culture. And guess what? It was part of the culture in Thessalonica. And Paul said, greet one another with a holy kiss, because what was he trying to express? What, what did that express in that culture? Love, right? Make sure that you're demonstrating brotherly love to one another. But you and I read it, and we're like, okay, we're going to translate that into a holy handshake, right? <laughs> right? But God's speaking to a culture different than ours, and so he uses those cultural artifacts. In Leviticus, ritual purity and impurity... That was part of their world. They understood what ritual purity and impurity was. That, uh, the closest that we can get to it <clears throat> is, um, well, I'll give you two analogies. When I was growing up as a young boy, I didn't understand a lot about girls, but I knew that they had one thing. What did I know that they had? They had cooties, right? <laughs> And cooties were this, it was this mysterious thing that somehow you, you could get just from touching, right? It would just transfer over to you. And well, ritual impurity kind of worked that way. Um, or here's another way to think of it, maybe more, more helpfully. Um, ritual purity and impurity, it, it was kind of like, uh, in some ways it was it worked the same way we think germs work today. So um, when, when uh, if you are sick and somebody's just had a newborn baby and you're, you've got the flu, can you go to the hospital, to, into that room to see the newborn baby? No. Your state of health impacts what you can do and where you can go in a hospital. Um, if you're healthy, can you go to a hospital and greet the newborn baby? Well, sure. Can you walk into the operating room? What do you have to do to walk into the operating room? You have to be sterilized, right? You need an even higher level. Well, that's how three ritual states, impurity, purity, and holiness worked, right? 
Just as our state of health determines what you can do and where you can go in a hospital, your, state of, your ritual state determined where you could go and what you could do at the tabernacle. And because the Israelites understood that, God said, hey, how will I communicate to them about my holiness and the need for purity? Oh, they've got this concept in their cultural ritual purity and impurity. I'll make use of that concept. So what I'm trying to say is, yeah, there will be things that are weird because God's speaking to a totally different culture. But if you just spend a bit of time uh, reading, taking the commentary, I explain these different cultural realities, all of a sudden wide vistas in Leviticus begin to open up. So there's the weirdness factor. What, w what was the second factor? There was the... Uh, the burdens. Yeah, the, the, all these things we don't do anymore. And, and how would you remember all those things anyway? I have been helped by thinking of the priests in Leviticus um, the same way that I think about a wedding coordinator today. Now, when Ski and I got married, I mean, <laughs> it was my first time, and so there were a ton of things that were new to me. And I, I had no idea, where am I supposed to stand, and when do I turn, and when, there were just so many things to keep track of. But I didn't worry, because the wedding coordinator explained all of those things to us. And as you read Leviticus, realize when the Israelites came to the tabernacle, the priests were there, and there were Levites there who would be able to walk them through these different things. Right? So if you're reading, you think, wow, there's just so Hey, they'll just walk you through. No worry. You didn't have to worry when you went to the tabernacle. Uh, there's the burdensome. There's the uh, uh, countercultural. Yeah, there are some things in Leviticus that go completely against the culture in terms of what, it, what our culture understands about, well, about sexual realities. Uh, let me just comment on, on one of these. Where Leviticus shows up most often in discussions in contemporary culture is around the area of homosexual practice. And that's because there are two verses in the book of Leviticus that clearly express you, you must not engage in homosexual practice, uh, homosexual sexual relationships. Uh, when I first started studying Leviticus, this was 1998, um, studied, was doing my PhD from 98 to 2001, um, and at that, that was a different world. Right? Uh, Same-sex marriage was legalized nowhere in the world, uh, and in a few short years, 15, everything changed. And so I had no idea at that time that Leviticus would be cited so much in contemporary culture, but cited so negatively because of the conflict. Well, why, do, why, does, why are those laws there in Leviticus? What's going on? And I would suggest to you, and you'll, you'll see this if you're reading through um, Leviticus 18 and 20, that section of the commentary, but I'd suggest to you that what's going on in Leviticus when it comes to those laws is when you're an Israelite reading those laws, you're reading them against the backdrop of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. If you're an Israelite, that's where your story begins. And as you're reading those laws against the backdrop of Genesis 1 and 2, what do you see in Genesis 1 and 2? Well, you see what God intends for the institution of marriage and for the institution of um, sexual relationships and what they're supposed to look like. So that by the time you get to Leviticus 18 and you see certain prohibitions, well, they make perfect sense to you because you realize, yeah, to engage in that kind of activity is to get, go against what God has created those things for. And that's in, in fact why laws on these different sexual prohibitions actually still do apply today. There's a strong, well, it's a growing movement, even in the evangelical world, to say, yeah, what the Bible has to say about sexual relationships, at least about some of them, we, we don't have to follow that anymore today. And, and I would say, no, actually, the reason we do is because those things are rooted in creation. So that's a, a whole other area 
where there's a conflict between what the Bible is teaching and culture that makes Leviticus sound especially strange. Uh, there's the ritual aspect of things. I mentioned sometimes we're suspicious of ritual. Um, anyone here sometimes feel suspicious of ritual? Do you identify with what I said in terms of it can feel like dead faith sometimes? And I, at least three of you are nodding your heads. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, for, for the three of you. Um, then I began to think, well, actually, where do we still have rituals in our society today? And the answer is, we tend to have rituals surrounding the things that are most important to us. Weddings. All sorts of rituals surrounding a wedding. Why? Because we want to set that part, that time apart, as really special. Birthdays. We've got all sorts of rituals around birthdays. Why? Well, because we're setting that day apart as special. Right? Funerals, birth, all of these things that are so important. And so all of a sudden, it actually turned ritual on its head for me. And it made me realize, actually, maybe one of the lessons to take away from the book of Leviticus is using ritual in a context like worship is a way of saying this is a really special time. Something really important is taking place here. So there are lots of different reasons why we struggle with Leviticus, but I think as we'll see, oh, laws. There are so many laws. I'll come back to that actually in a few minutes. But what I, I hope you're beginning to see is with just a little work, you can actually begin to, to gain these insights that begin to unlock the book of Leviticus and, and allow you to be able to hear God's voice to you today in 2019 teaching you the same kind of principles and values he was trying to teach the Israelites back in uh, the 15th century B.C. Right? So with that, let me, let me begin to set the context of the book of Leviticus for us here. So we've talked about why we struggle with Leviticus. Why is Leviticus important? Let me give you uh, several different reasons. Uh, one of the first is the New Testament writers thought it was pretty important. So there are, how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39, right? And they're often quoted in the New Testament. So if you were to line up the 39 books of the Old Testament in order from most quoted to least quoted, right? where would Leviticus show up? Now, if we were writing the New Testament, where would Leviticus show up? Right? Yeah, it'd be, it would be battling with numbers for 38 and 39, right? First Chronicles, maybe. It actually shows up in position six. Sixth most quoted book in the New Testament. Right? New Testament writers thought it was important. And that's not surprising because, second reason, the things that it touches on, sacrifice, sin, atonement, these are all central to the work of the Lord Jesus. Uh, in fact, I, I dare say that if you want to understand the work of Jesus more deeply, study Leviticus. Um, let me get at this in, in a couple different ways. Think about atonement as one example. Uh, Atonement, I gave a definition in the, in the first service. Does anyone remember the definition that God in his love has made a way to deal with our wrongs so that we might, be made, we might be made right with him? That's atonement. God in his love has made a way to deal with our wrongs so we might be made right with him. Well, if, if you don't understand uh, how sacrifice accomplishes atonement, it's going to be really hard to understand what Jesus does on the cross. And let me get at that by telling you about two very different people. Uh, the first was a young man, a uh, Western, modern young man. And this was a few years ago. Uh, a movie by Mel Gibson came out called The Passion of the Christ. How many have seen The Passion of the Christ? If you've seen that movie, you remember that it begins in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's... It, 
Jesus is arrested, and for two hours, you are watching his trial and then his crucifixion. There's no English in the movie. There's hardly any speech. When they speak, they're speaking in Aramaic. There are subtitles. Um, uh, After the crucifixion, which just goes on and on in terms of the suffering our Lord endures. There's this brief, at the very end, brief allusion to the resurrection. You're not quite sure what it is. There's this light and this tomb and this kind of thing. Well, this was in all the major movie theaters. And so I was fascinated to see how are people in our culture responding to this movie. And one night on the local news, they were interviewing people on the way out of the movie theater to ask what did they think. And this young man comes out and they asked him, what did you think of the movie? And he said, and it might sound funny to some of you at first, but he wasn't trying to be funny. He said, well, it was okay, I guess, but it didn't have much of a plot. It didn't have much of a plot. And I thought, it didn't have much of a plot. What is he? Oh. If you don't know the backstory, then what had you just seen take place? Some man who is for some reason arrested, beaten, killed, and that was it. There's no story. Let me contrast that with someone very different or a group of people very different. Years ago, there were some missionaries that went to Papua New Guinea, and uh, they were working in a tribe. They They spent months, years learning the language of the tribe, and they finally got to a place where they were ready to share the biblical message with the tribe's people. Well, they knew that the New Testament didn't make sense without the Old Testament, so they began back in Genesis. They talked to them about the creation of the world, and they marched through the biblical story. And when they got to places about sacrifice, you know, the kind of thing focused on in Leviticus, they explained how the blood of a of a spotless lamb uh, could be offered uh, on behalf of the the blood of the sinner and that the the person's sin could be forgiven by means of this. Well, finally, they get to the New Testament and the stories of the Gospels. And for a week, Jesus is the hero of the village. Villagers would get up before dawn to come and and hear. They'd recorded these these messages on on, uh, tape recorders that had... Uh, they were hand-cranked, literally, because batteries wouldn't last in the, in the climate. And they'd replay these stories, and um, uh, it went on like this for a whole week. Well, by the end of the week, the missionaries got to the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. And what the missionaries did is they invited some tribespeople from another tribe that had converted to Christianity to come in and to act out the story. And the person who was playing Jesus had a t-shirt, but under the t-shirt they'd put a bag of red dye. And as the missionary began to tell the story about Jesus being arrested and beaten, they videotaped this. You could see on the faces of the people, they just didn't understand. Why would anyone want to do these kinds of things to Jesus? And then they got to the part of the story where the soldier comes up, and you remember in the Gospels, a soldier pierces the side of Jesus with a spear. And so when that happened, the bag of dye broke, and the shirt began to be soaked as though red with blood. And at that moment, you could see the dawn of comprehension on some of the faces of the tribes people. And as the missionary went on to the the crucifixion took place, Jesus went into the tomb, he came out again, resurrected, and the missionary explained, Jesus is now alive and he's, he's the Lamb of God to take away your sin. And all of a sudden, person after person started to pop up and in, in, in their language they said, Itau, which is a way of saying, yes, I believe. And they went on to say, I believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God who's taken away my sin. And another person over here popped up and said the same thing in person after person. And and in this tribe, the way that you showed excitement was by jumping up and down. And all of a sudden, it it broke. And the whole tribe turned into this mosh pit of praise, (laughs) jumping up and down, praising God for Jesus. And they understood what Jesus had done 
because they understood the kinds of things that Leviticus talks about. Got Leviticus? <laughs> we need more Leviticus. So why does it matter? Oh, it's because it makes the gospel all the more beautiful and all the more real. So, we know why we struggle with it. There are some reasons why it matters. Uh, let me orient you to where it fits in the story. Uh, first, where it fits historically and geographically. So, um, I want you all to be Israelites for a moment. All right? So, you all are Israelites right now. When you receive the book of Leviticus... What has just happened? Where have you just come from? You've just come from Egypt. You've been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. You cried out to the Lord for deliverance. He sent Moses. Moses came to Pharaoh, uh, said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, hey, baby, you got to let God's people go. And that's a song. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, John will sing it for you afterwards. But so Moses comes. He's delivered you all. Um, he, he's led you to, where are you right now? You're at Mount Sinai. So you get to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. And you're going to stay at Mount Sinai for the rest of Exodus, for all of Leviticus, up until Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Right? So all of Leviticus is given in just over a year period while you're sitting at Mount Sinai. So geographically, that's where you are. And at this point in time, <clears throat> Leviticus, you are so thankful it's just arrived. In Exodus chapter 40, you remember what, what's happened? The Lord has said, I want you to build me a tabernacle. So you Israelites, you built the Lord a tabernacle. You finished building it in Exodus chapter 40. And then what you saw was the cloud of glory descend. Flashes of lightning, thunder, brilliant light. God's presence had now come to fill the tent of meeting in the midst of you. And if you're an Israelite, this leads to burning questions. How is this going to work? How can we have the holy God of the universe in our midst with all of our sin and impurity without him melting us? And how can we? He's called us to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What's that look like anyway? I mean, these are burning, very practical questions for you. And the answer is Leviticus which begins in chapters 1 through 7 by explaining all the different sacrifices you can bring to atone for your sin and impurity. And you say, praise God for Leviticus. Actually, I want you to say it. Praise God for Leviticus. Go ahead. Praise, praise God for Leviticus. Yeah, and then you get chapters 8 through 10, which, which describe how priests can be ordained so that you have priests who can mediate on your behalf presenting sacrifices and pray, praying for you. And you say... And then you get chapters 11 through 15, which are all about ritual impurity. And they, they tell you how to make sure you can cleanse yourself so you don't offend a holy God in your midst. And you say, Praise God. Oh, and then you get to Leviticus 16, the day of atonement in which this one day of the year where you can be sure all of your sins and impurities are dealt with. And you say, Praise God. And finally, you get Leviticus 17 through 27, full of all of these laws which help you to understand how to be a holy people, reflecting God's goodness into the world, his justice, his mercy and love. And you say, Praise God. You see, we look at Leviticus often as a burden. If you're an Israelite, you should look at it as a blessing because it answers questions that are foremost on your mind. So this is how Leviticus fits into the flow of the story. You Israelites are so thankful it's just shown up. Right? Uh, here's an overarching theme. So now, as modern people reading the book of Leviticus, let me give you a, a, a picture to keep in mind that could help you as you begin to read through the book. 
Right? And the picture is a, the covenant king in the midst of his covenant people. So, so if you can read Leviticus thinking, oh, the king of kings has just shown up in the midst of his people and he's calling us to be a kingdom in which his values are on display, that's really going to help you in reading the book. It's really going to make sense of things. Let me just show you, how do we know that there's a king or, or kingdom theme? There are all sorts of ways. The, the Ark of the Covenant, well, that's the footstool of the divine king. Right? Uh, when you look through, you, this, this comes right on the heels of a covenant. In the ancient world, covenants were made often between a king and a people. That's what happens here with Leviticus, the tabernacle in the midst of the camp. Do you know, we have uh, <clears throat> from this, um, this relief um, carved into the wall in an ancient temple, we've got this picture of what the ancient Egyptian war camp looked like. And when you look at this picture of the war camp, what you'll see is you'll see the tents of all the soldiers around the middle, and right in the middle is the tent of the king. And guess what? The tent of the king is rectangular in shape. It has a forecourt, and it has an inner court. And the forecourt is twice as long as the inner court. And you're thinking, and? <laughs> well, guess where the tabernacle was? It was right in the middle of the camp. Oh, and, and guess what it had? <clears throat> Two rooms. A forecourt, the holy place, and an inner court, the holy of holies. Oh, and, and guess who dwelled there? The Lord, the king. Right? Again, if you're an ancient Israelite looking at that, you're thinking, oh, no wonder the Lord has make a tent like that. That's a king's tent, and he's the king in our midst. Right? So you go through, and there are all these different things. We, and we won't go through all of them today. But, but there's this king and kingdom theme. And that actually helps us. Let me come back to, um, someone mentioned earlier, the, the penalties which seem so severe to us. Uh, let me talk about Nadab and Abihu for a second. Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. They come with this offering. And all of a sudden, fire comes out from the presence of the Lord and devours them. Wow, that seems really extreme. Well, actually, once you understand this king-kingdom theme, it begins to make more sense. You see, in the ancient Near East, it was a severe breach of royal protocol to barge into the throne room of a king. Do you remember later on from the book of Esther? Do you remember Esther says, Mordecai says, hey, Esther, go into the king's throne room. And she says, if I go in there uninvited, what do I risk? I risk death, right? Well, when you read Leviticus 10 carefully, you read it together with Leviticus 16, do you know what you see? Nadab and Abihu tried to barge into the Holy of Holies without being invited. They were taking their life in their hands when they did it, and they should have known it. Yeah, you don't barge into the throne room of an earthly king let alone the king of kings. Right? Or again, once you understand the Lord is king, well, then you can understand your sin against him is actually a, it's an act of treason. Historically, what's been the penalty for treason? Death. And the Israelites knew that. And so some of the penalties which seem so severe is because they're severe acts of treason. And they merit the penalty that treason deserves. Right? All that to say, understanding. As you, if you can read Leviticus thinking this is a holy king in the midst of his kingdom people, it will really help you understand the book. Let me just uh, do a few other things here. So we try to end by 1045. Is that right? All right. So let me finish... What I want to finish here. Let me finish uh, by talking about this. There are some things Leviticus has helped me understand much more deeply. Uh, one of those is, um, of course, 
the sacrifice of Christ. And uh, we'll be talking about that. I focused on that in the sermon in first service. I'll do the same in the second. Let me talk about holiness for a second because Leviticus really helped me understand holiness a lot, a lot more clearly. Holiness, to be holy, simply means to be in some way unique, to be in some way set apart. And what the book of Leviticus helps us to see is that God is holy, utterly unique, utterly set apart in terms of three things, his power, his purity, and his love. His power. A lot of times in the Bible when it talks about God's holiness, it's often in the context of him showing up in power in some incredible way. Right? You get the vision of Isaiah in the temple and he sees the Lord and the, the temple shaking. You see his power. And what are the angels crying out? Holy, 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 right? In Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 9, the Lord shows up at the tabernacle and the cloud of glory descends. And if it's like other appearances of the cloud of glory, there's lightning and thunder. And what are the people? They fall on their face because they recognize the holiness of God in terms of his power. And for me today, I, I see that aspect of God's holiness. Um, sometimes when I'm out in nature, have you ever been... Standing in front of a mountain in Colorado, and you begin to feel so small because the mountain is so great. Or under a sky littered with stars, and the heavens just seem so great, and you feel so small. And you recognize if the heavens are great, how much greater the one who created. God is utterly distinct in terms of his power. I also see this aspect of God's holiness uh, when I see his judgment for sin enter into this world. When we lived in England, um, I heard about a church where there were two elders who had affairs with each other's wives. And within one year, all four, both couples, all four of the people had died of cancer. Right? Now, is that a coincidence? I suppose it could be. But it's hard not to think that that was God showing up with his power. God is holy, utterly distinct in terms of his power. Power without purity becomes tyranny. So praise God, he's holy in terms of his power, but also in terms of his purity. Uh, the, when you read through Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19 is, um, this is the Sermon on the Mount of the book of Leviticus. Right? This is where you get uh, love your neighbor as yourself. When you reap your fields, don't go to the very edge, etc. And the whole chapter begins by saying, be holy because I am holy. In other words, do you want to live a morally upright life? Who's your model? Well, the Lord is, right, in terms of his purity. And I see this aspect of God's holiness today when in my own life I experience this discipline for sin. I can think of two different times in my life where I have literally experienced physical discipline um, for my sin. That looking back, I can see that was the Lord in his love disciplining me because he, he is utterly distinct in terms of his moral purity. But, but finally, he's utterly distinct in terms of his love. No one loves like he does. When you read through these kind of laws about not reaping to the very edge of your field, etc., when you practice those things, what do the people on the other end experience? They experience love. Right? When you live out God's laws, people experience love. God is love. Let me put it, here's what hit me in, in reading through Leviticus. It doesn't matter if I read the Bible a lot and pray a lot and avoid all sorts of sin, it's great to do all those things. But if you do all of those things and you are not overflowing with love, you are not holy. I am not holy. 
if I'm not full of love, then I'm not holy because to be holy is to reflect who? God. And God is what? He's utterly distinct in terms of his love. Sometimes we think of holiness in terms of things we should not do. Don't do this, don't do that. Let me encourage you to begin to think of holiness in terms of being extravagant in how you love other people. Because to be loving is to reflect the holy love of God. That takes us for time. I'm sorry we don't have time for questions, but I encourage you to sign up. Uh, Leviticus is part of God's word, and it's worth some of the work it's going to take to get there. So um, can I pray for you all? Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you um, that you always want to help us to understand what it means to know you and what it means to reflect your goodness and justice and mercy and love into, the, into this world. You've given us that privilege as your people. We bless you for it. Strengthen us in doing it. I pray for those who do undertake this study that you would make their study rich, that you would speak to them, and that you would encourage and help them through this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.